بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode in our series on the journey to the afterlife. We discussed everything regarding the journey of the soul after death and through the day of resurrection as well as the descriptions of the hellfire. And today we are continuing with our beautiful description of paradise. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you and I the highest levels of paradise. My dear brothers and sisters, the path to Jannah, the striving towards paradise takes some effort without a doubt. And no one can say otherwise. Because if paradise was free, you would not have to do anything. But paradise requires your effort and my effort. And the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we earn through our effort. And the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that He created us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in our hearts and knows when we turn towards Him and what we do. And He knows what is concealed and what is public. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Hellfire is veiled by desires. And paradise is veiled by hardships. And this is authentic hadith reported by Bukhari and others. Now, what does it mean that it's veiled by it? It means it is surrounded by it. So there are hardships. And you have to go through these hardships in order to get to paradise. You have to put in the effort. Imam Nawi rahimahullah says, Both are veiled as described. And whoever tears down the veil will reach what is hidden behind it. And then he said, the veil of paradise is torn down by going through hardships and the veil of the hellfire is torn down by giving in to your whims and to your desires. Hardship includes striving consistently and patiently in worship. It includes restraining one's anger, forgiving other people, being patient, giving in charity, being kind to those who mistreat you, resisting physical desires, and so on and so forth. And so Imam Nawid Rahmullah describes that this veil, this path to paradise, requires some effort, without a doubt. But once you start doing these things and pulling your nafs through these things against what your nafs wants of desires, then you start to enjoy these things by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we said before, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that this life is like a cage for the believers. And it is like a paradise for the disbelievers. So Ibn Hajar rahimullah, when he was the chief justice, he was riding through the marketplace of Egypt. And somebody came up to him, a Jewish man came up to him with raggedy clothes, with disheveled clothes and a disheveled appearance. He looked very poor and raggedy. He said, oh, Shaykh al-Islam, you claim that your prophet said that the dunya, this life, is a prison for the believers. And that this life is a paradise for the disbelievers. So what kind of prison are you in? What kind of paradise am I in? Meaning, look at me and look at you. You're riding a horse, you're well-groomed, you look very well, you look like you're healthy, you have uh, money, and look at me. And then Ibn Hajar rahimullah responded and said, regarding what Allah has prepared for me in the hereafter of its bliss, then this life is like a prison compared to it. And regarding what Allah has prepared for you in the hereafter of punishment then this life it's as if you are in Jannah right now you are in paradise right now because what's to come is much worse and the man said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh the man became Muslim the path to paradise requires our sincerity and your sincerity is what will lead you to your actions because my dear brothers and sisters the more you want to do something the more likely you are to get it done but the weaker your intention is the weaker your sincerity is the less likely you are to complete it if you want to wake up for Fajr you have to have a strong intention. But if your intention is weak, then you are not likely to wake up, even if you put all of your alarms and you ask people to wake you up. So it comes back to your intention, your sincerity. Why are you doing what you're doing? So Al-Hassan al-Basri reports a story for us. And Allahu alam whether it's authentic or not, but it's a very interesting story that has a lesson behind it. He said one time there was a tree that was being worshipped. So the people were worshipping this tree. So one of, the, one of the believers of that town or village, he became very upset. He wanted to go and chop down this tree. So he took an axe. And on the way there, this old man comes to him. This old man was shaitan in the form of a man. And so the man says to him, shaitan says to him, what are you planning on doing? He says, I want to cut down this tree. He says, you don't worship this tree. Why do you care? He says, I'm going to chop it down. 
This is sincerity for the sake of Allah. So shaitan tells him, how about instead of you chopping down this tree, I will give you two dirhams every morning, meaning some wealth. And I'll place it in your house or under your pillow, I'll place it somewhere in your house. And every morning you'll have these two dirhams. So the man agrees and he goes back home. He wakes up and there are two dirhams. And the second day he wakes up and there are two dirhams. On the third day there's no money. He becomes angry and enraged. So he goes again to cut down the tree. On the way there, the shaitan meets him. He says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to chop down this tree that is worshipped instead of Allah. And the shaitan tells him, you have lied. There is no way that you're going to be able to do it. The man kept going to chop down the tree. As he tried to chop it down, the earth swallowed him up until it almost killed him, meaning he kept falling, he kept falling, kept falling. Something was happening to him. And then he came back. He said, do you know who I am? The old man asked him, do you know who I am? He said, I am shaitan and I met you for the first time when you were angry for the sake of Allah. And you went to cut down the tree because it was being worshipped. And I had no power over you. I couldn't stop you. You would have succeeded if you continued. He says, I deceived you by offering you money, those two dinars. And then you stopped what you were doing for the sake of Allah. And when you didn't receive that money, now you're going to cut down the tree because of yourself. Because of yourself, because of these two dinars. And rather, now because your intention is insincere, I have gotten mastery or power over you. So my dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to the issue of intentions, you and I must be careful to do everything purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because paradise is something that we all strive for and it requires some effort. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is no one amongst you who does not have two positions, one in paradise and one in hellfire. Every one of us has a place in Jannah and a place in the hellfire. The believer will have a house built for him in paradise and his house in the hellfire will be demolished. The house in the hellfire will be demolished. And this is reported by Abu Huraira and uh, Ibn Abi Hatim and Ibn Kathir mentioned this. So these are two houses, they are already prepared for us. What this gives us is a reality a taste of reality, that there is a very likely chance you could go to the hellfire based on your actions. And there's a chance you can go to your house in paradise. But once you enter one or the other eternally, then the other place is destroyed. So if you enter paradise, then your home in the hellfire is destroyed. And if you enter the hellfire, and this person enters permanently, then their place in Jannah is destroyed. And this was mentioned as also one of the things of Al-Barzakh, the stage of death. The people in the grave are shown their house in the hellfire, the believers, and the house will be destroyed and they will be shown their place in paradise and they will be told this is where you're going to go. This is the place that you're going to. And so my dear brothers and sisters, every action or inaction on your part will lead to one or the other. Every step you take will either be a step towards the house in paradise that's already built for you or the place in hellfire that's already built for you. So you strive towards paradise. You strive towards paradise so that the house in the hellfire is destroyed. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I from ever coming near the hellfire. Now most of the people of paradise are humble. Most of the people of paradise are poor or oppressed. They struggled in this life. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Shall I not tell you about the people of Jannah? They said, yes, of course. He said, every weak and oppressed person, if he were to implore Allah for anything, to ask for anything, Allah would grant it to him. Allah would give it to him. This is reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. So Imam Nawi rahmahullah said about this hadith, this refers to the people who others despise. And it refers to the people who are scorned and oppressed in this world because of their weak position in this world. What is meant is that most of the people of Jannah will be of this type, but not all of them will be. Meaning most of the people of Jannah will have been oppressed in some way or another. And nowadays there's so much oppression around the world, especially for those who say, La ilaha illallah. They have to be strong. The Prophet ﷺ said, I stood at the gates of Jannah and I saw that most of the people who entered were the poor and the destitute. He said, and then the people of means were held back. The people had a lot of wealth. They were detained, as we said before. So while the people of the hellfire were burned in the hellfire, taken to the hellfire, and the people who were poor were allowed to enter before the rich. So the people who were poor were allowed to enter before the rich. So this humility is, is what will lead us to paradise. And humility leads you to servitude. But when you have pride, arrogance, this is what leads to the hellfire. And arrogance is so widespread in our times. There's an interesting story about one of the people of the past, a scholar of the past from the 14th century, by the name of Sheikh As-Sa'di. Although the story may or may not be authentic, the lesson behind it is very true. He was invited to a, a huge wedding, a very wealthy person's wedding. So on the way to the wedding, 
he notices a lot of people are heading towards this wedding and they're wearing nice clothes. Very nice and elegant clothing. And he's wearing his simple clothes. They're not dirty, but they're simple. He goes to the place where the wedding is and he stands in the front where the usher is taking people inside. And the usher comes out and he looks at him. He looks at the sheikh and then he looks away. He doesn't invite him inside to the wedding. And the sheikh decides to stay there, to just stand there. He doesn't go inside. He doesn't say, hey, I'm the sheikh or hey, I was invited. He stands outside. The usher comes back in or comes back out and takes somebody else who's wearing nice clothes and they go back in. They come back out, they invite other people and then go back in. And then when there was nobody outside except the sheikh, the usher didn't do or say anything. It's as if he disregarded him. So Sheikh Al-Sadi decides to try something out. He goes to a nearby store and he tells the man, I want to borrow, I want to pay to borrow the most fancy, luxurious clothes that you have. The most fancy clothes that you have. So the man tells him, are you sure you want that? He knows he's a scholar. He's like, are you sure this is what you want? He says, yes. So he borrows the nicest clothes and a very beautiful and nice gem studded turban and he goes back to the wedding place. The usher sees him and says, welcome inside, Sheikh. we've been waiting for you. He goes inside and he stays quiet. The people inside come up to him and they shake his hand. They say, welcome, Sheikh. we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you, we've been waiting for you. He was outside the entire time waiting. So he sits down at his place at the table to eat. They bring him some rice and some soup. And he starts to take some of the soup and he starts to put it on his sleeve, on the clothes that he's wearing. He takes some of the rice and he starts putting it on the clothes. And the people are shocked. They're looking at him. They're asking him, what are you doing, Sheikh? What are you doing? Are you feeding your clothes? This is the strangest thing we have ever seen. What's, what's happening here? And then finally he spoke. He said, you think this is strange that I'm feeding food to my clothes? What's more strange is that I was standing outside for a long time. But because of my simple clothes, you wouldn't even recognize me. Nobody would even look at me. They considered him as one of the people you don't even look at. The undesirable types of people in society, the low class. But once I wore something nice and luxurious and expensive, then you invited me in and then everyone came to me and welcomed me as if I had just appeared. So therefore, I must assume that the food is for my clothes and not for me because I was here way before these nice, elegant, luxurious clothes. And so he taught the people a lesson of pride, taught the people a lesson of humility. He taught the people that when you are looking at the outside and the appearance of others, and that's what you judge them on, and that's what your life is about, you become shallow. And this is not the path of humility and not the path of Allah, because Allah looks at our actions and what is in our hearts. And you, of course, you stay well-groomed and you stay dressing nice, but going above and beyond and dressing nice, fancy, luxurious clothes to show off to the people, this is very shallow. And this is not from Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from having this kind of shallowness and from having any kind of pride in regards to the way that we conduct ourselves. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be broke before, before man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the break. Before we took a short break, we were talking about the path to paradise. And the path has many hardships that you have to go through. You have to be patient. You have to forgive others. You have to stand and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to tear down this veil that might seem hard at first to your soul, to your nafs, because your nafs only wants to relax and to pursue its desires. But once you tear down this veil and you see what is behind it of paradise, meaning once you've reached this level of enlightenment, these things, these hardships, will become things that you enjoy. Pleasures. So you begin to enjoy praying. You start to enjoy fasting in the heat of the day. You start to enjoy all of these acts of worship and the things that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also spoke about the issue of pride and humility and how humility is a path to paradise and pride and arrogance is a path to the hellfire. And part of pride is to look down on other people. And so be careful not to fall into the trap that many people fall into these days, including many Muslims, which is that people are judging each other based on their outer appearance. So in some cultures, everyone has to wear brand new clothes every Eid, brand new clothes every time there's a wedding, brand new this, brand new that. And they're always wearing these brand names to show off. If you're wearing clothes to show off to the people, what kind of person are you? This is a type of insecurity and a type of shallowness. So wear clothes that are nice and well-groomed for yourself, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to look beautiful and to look nice. But don't go out and judging and look down at other people or feel like you have to dress for the people. 
because that means you need validation from the people and not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get your validation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will always be content and happy. Now, some of the people of the past used to ask, the Sahaba used to ask about the children who die young. What will happen to them? What will happen to the children who die before the age of puberty, before the age of accountability? And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, a Muslim whose three children die before reaching the age of puberty will be admitted to paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his mercy. So for the parents whose children die, if your children die and you are patient, you are patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you believe in him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use this uh, trial for you to allow you to enter paradise. One time a woman asked the Prophet sallallahu what about two children? He said, and two as well. And this is reported by Bukhari. And some of the scholars said, even if one dies, and it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are patient, and you believe in him, and you submit to him with his decree, then you are also guaranteed paradise through that child, through the trial of the child passing away. Now, the Prophet ﷺ told us about the children of paradise, the children who die, rather, before uh, the Day of Judgment. And so the Prophet ﷺ said the little ones, these little children, are the page boys of paradise. One of them will meet his father or his parents, and they will take hold of their clothes. Imagine, on the Day of Judgment, the children who die young, they are means of you entering paradise, how they will take hold of his clothes or the parents' clothes, or their hands. They will hold their hands. And then he said, just as I'm taking the hold of the hem of this garment, and the child will not let go. Imagine, on the Day of Judgment, the child was, is not letting go of the parents, or he's tugging on their clothes and he's not letting go. And then he said, and he will not let go until Allah admits that person, that parent, or the two parents, to paradise. So the children are a means of the parents entering Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the children of the believers will be in paradise. They, were, they are being cared for by Ibrahim السلام, and Sarah until they give them back to their parents on the day of resurrection. So the children who die young, the children who die young, they are being cared for by Ibrahim السلام, and his wife Sarah, and they are being cared for in paradise, meaning until the day of resurrection. And they will be given back to their parents on the day of judgment. And this is an authentic hadith. Now in regards to the children of the disbelievers, some people ask about this issue as well. And some people are hasty in these matters. And even with the children of the believers, some people say every single child that dies is going to paradise. Allah knows best about the children and what happens to them. Of course, we assume well and generally we say those who die young before the age of puberty will enter paradise. We accept that as a general thing, but it's not right to always specify, yes, this person is in Jannah for sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and He is the merciful and He is the generous. Ibn Hajar says, this issue is supported by the hadith of Anas in which the Prophet ﷺ said, I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those children who die young, for those children who die young of mankind, that they will not ever be punished, that they will not be punished, and that was granted to me. That was accepted for me. Meaning the children of mankind, when they die young, they will be protected. Of course, they will never be punished. Punished how? Punished in the grave, punished on the day of resurrection. These are children who had no understanding or rather they were not able to understand or they were not accountable for doing good deeds or staying away from things that are prohibited. So accountability starts at the age of puberty and it requires sanity as well. Someone asked, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is in paradise? Who will enter Jannah? He said the prophets are in paradise, the martyrs, the shuhada are in paradise, and the newborns are in paradise. And this is a hadith Hassan. So these three categories are mentioned as guaranteed of the people of paradise. As for the children who die, and they are children of disbelievers. Some of the scholars mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ included these with the children of mankind. So this was part of his dua, and that was accepted for him. Others said that these children, Allah knows best what they would have done if they were older, because Allah is the all-knowing. Another opinion is that these, these children, they will be tested on the day of resurrection, and they will have uh, intellect and understanding. They will be accountable in a different way than the age that they died at in this life. And so Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, and others, they said that this is something that they will go through on the day of resurrection. So they will be tested and they will be told, for example, to do something such as enter the hellfire. And if they obey the commandment of Allah, they submit to Allah, they would not be punished by the hellfire. Rather, this test will be passed for them so they will be allowed to enter paradise as an example. And so he attributed this opinion to Imam Ahmad and others as well. Now, it was proven that the people who lived between the time of Prophet Isa salam, between Prophet Isa and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, between Jesus and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people that are in between, they will also be tested on the Day of Judgment, 
on the in the hereafter. And so Al-Bayhaqi Al reports this and others, they say this is the correct opinion, that these people, they lived at a time when there was no messenger for them, so they will be tested on the Day of Judgment. They will be held accountable in a different way. And this is why you cannot say someone is going to paradise or hellfire unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet وسلم, specifically told us this person is going to paradise or hellfire. So we don't judge on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are leaders of paradise. Imagine you're entering paradise and you're noticing that there are certain types of leaders for certain types of people. What is an example of this? The leaders of the men of Jannah. The leaders of the men of Jannah. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and many other Sahaba reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Bakr and Umar عنهمah, will be the leaders of the men of paradise from the earlier and the later generations. So Abu Bakr and Umar are given this high status again. This indicates their status in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make them the, leader, the leaders of the men of paradise. As for the leaders of the youth, the leaders of the youth, a tirmidhi reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Hasan and al Hussein are the leaders of the youth of paradise. And this is proven by many other texts as well. So Al-Hasan and al Hussein are going to be the leaders of the youth of paradise. How about the leaders of the women of Jannah, the greatest of the women of paradise? The Prophet ﷺ one day, he drew four lines in the sand. He drew four lines in the sand. And when he drew the lines, he asked the Sahaba around him, do you know what these lines are? They said, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, these are the best women. These are the best women. The best women of paradise are Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, and Fatima bint Muhammad وسلم, and Maryam bint Imran, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. This is an authentic hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that Khadija and Fatima and Asiya and Maryam are the four greatest women of paradise. The four greatest women of paradise. Maryam has an entire surah in the Quran dedicated to her. May Allah be pleased with her. So these women were perfect examples, beautiful examples of righteous people. Righteous people. And so these are going to be the leaders of the women of paradise. And as we know, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, she believed in the Prophet ﷺ without any hesitation whatsoever. And she consoled him and she comforted him and she supported him in every way possible. And you remember the hadith we mentioned earlier in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his blessings and his salam to her through Jibreel alayhi salam. That they sent salam to Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her. So she was the first to believe in this ummah, the first Muslimah. The first person to submit, to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we have the example of Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. The wife of Fir'aun. Now Fir'aun, he wanted the powers and luxuries of this world. He wanted people to worship him as if he were divine. And so her husband, he tortured her until her soul departed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so Asiya is mentioned even in the Quran, the wife of Fir'aun, she said, Rabbi ibn li indaka baytan fil jannah. In paradise, build me a house, a palace. And so she rejected Fir'aun. She rejected his evil works and his evil followers. وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ Fir'aun. Save me from Fir'aun and his works and his uh, actions. So this is the reason that she's in such a high position. The third uh, that we mentioned is Fatima Zahra. So Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, the daughter of the Prophet wasallam. She was patient, she was forbearing, she feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was raised by the educator of humanity. By the educator of humanity. And of course, Maryam was mentioned in the Quran as one of the greatest women. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her. In Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisail alameen. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you. And He purified you and He chose you over all the women of mankind. And so these are the four greatest women of paradise. Now, we know of the hadith of the ten sahaba, the ten companions who are guaranteed paradise. And there are many others as well. But this is the hadith about the ten. Mubashireen, the ones who are given glad tidings of Jannah. Who are these ten? They are Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and they are Umar al-Khattab and Uthman and Ali, the first four Khulafa. And they include Az Zubair, they include Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Sa'id ibn Abi Waqas, Sa'id ibn Zayd, and Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah. And so all of these are considered the ten Mubashirin in Jannah. Now we know that some of the other people, some of the other Sahaba, are mentioned in other ahadith of being of the people of Jannah. Many other companions are mentioned as the people of Jannah. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, My successor is in paradise. My successor will be in Jannah. And then he said, His successor will be in paradise. And the third and the fourth will be in paradise. Who are the first four successors of the Prophet ﷺ? They are the Khulafa as we know them. 
the rightly guided caliphs. And this is another indication, another indication that this was a prophecy from the Prophet ﷺ about Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And we also know that the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Bakr, you are free from the hellfire. And this is also after the time that he donated a lot of wealth. You are free from the hellfire, as was reported by Tirmidhi and others in Sahih Isnad. So all of these companions and more, such as Abdullah ibn Salam, Zayd ibn Haritha, uh, Haritha ibn Nu'man, Bilal radiallahu an, all of these companions are mentioned as of the people of Jannah, including the one that we mentioned in the beginning of the topic of paradise, Abu Dahdah radiallahu an, who gave up his entire garden, gave up all of his palm trees so that he will have a place in Jannah, so they will have a palm tree in Jannah. And some of the scholars say that even Waraqa will be of the people of Jannah because the Prophet وسلم, said, do not slander Waraqa, do not slander him, for I have seen that he will be or he will have one or two gardens in paradise. And this is reported by Al-Hakim in his Sahih. And so Waraqa, he's the one that believed in the Prophet وسلم, when Khadija brought him at the beginning of the revelation. Do you remember Khadija brought the Prophet وسلم, to Waraqa? So he asked Allah to let him live until he saw the Messenger وسلم, so that he could support him. And he passed away shortly thereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the highest levels of paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for shortcomings and to purify us of our sins and to choose us to be of those who do good so that we could enter the highest levels of paradise. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the motivation on a daily basis to worship Him as He deserves to be worshipped. This concludes our episode for today. We will see you next time inshallah ta'ala as we continue talking about the delights of Jannah, the beautiful delights and experiences of paradise. Jazakumullahu khaira wa sallillahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be brought before man Now you shall have to explain your whole life span What you did in the open Small shall today be revealed. Your deeds shall then be weighed in a scale. This shall determine if you pass or fail.